Greetings, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the weekly Mormon News Roundup. This is June 23rd, 2023. This is episode 121. We've got a fabulous show. I'm d -Base. I am talent on loan from Colab. Every week, my crew and I, we ruminate on the great and spacious beehive. Thanks so much for joining us to discuss the contemporary events in Mormonism. I'd like to welcome onto my program my fabulous co-host, Summer Rain. Summer, how's it going? Going good. Excited to be here. Great. It's great to have you on. Now, who are you and what are you all about? So my name is Summer Rain. I um, live in Utah now. I was raised on the East Coast. My parents converted when I was three years old. My father was playing in the NFL at the time. He came from a Baptist background. My mom came from a Catholic background. And they had me and decided to become LDS. So I uh, grew up on the East Coast my whole life. Grew up also in Trinidad and Tobago. That's where my mother is from. I uh, lived in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. I went to BYU for one semester, went to Syracuse, ended up leaving Syracuse um, in communications, became a uh, public relations intern with the Oakland Raiders, left Oakland Raiders, went over to the Philadelphia Eagles when Andy Reid was there and did community relations for them. From there, I became an international flight attendant and met my husband in New York City at a singles ward. We ended up getting married within six months of dating, so very LDS in that way, and moved out to Utah. I got sealed in the Bountiful Temple. We now have three children. I am what they call PIMO, uh, physically and mentally out. I do not believe the truth claims, but my husband does, so I'm in a mixed faith marriage in that way. My youngest is about to get baptized, and my oldest is only only 12. So young kids. Yeah, my father is the current congressman for District 4. He is the first black congressman of Utah for Utah, which is very exciting. I have speak three languages, English, snark, and sarcasm, and I'm fluent mostly in those last two. So excited to be here and ready to get down to the news. Well, great. It's great to have you on. And we're going to jump right into news here. Here's our agenda for this week. We're going to give you some temple updates. We're going to talk about some incredible alleged Mormon miracles in Scotland and in England. We're going to talk about Donald Trump versus the Deseret News. And of course, the Deseret News is the church's news outlet. We're also going to talk about Lloyd Newell, who's retiring from the music and the spoken word. And we're going to give a happy birthday to Susan's husband. We've got a big episode on hand. And the first thing that we're going to talk about here is the Mormon History Association just took place a couple of days ago. And the church's historian Elder McKay explains finally why the church purchased the Kirtland Temple for $192 million. I mean, the church bought a bunch of other properties as well as that were rolled into that number. But we finally get the rationale for why the church bought these from the Community of Christ it was a historic building. Let's see what Elder McKay has to say about what the church is up to. It is glorious. It is eternal. It is heavenly. It's humbling to be here in this temple. Many inside and out of the church wondered why we would ever spend that much money on anything other than humanitarian aid. As a curator, we have these buildings, we have the artifacts, we have the documents. At the end of the day, they can help testify of the gospel and of what God has done for his children. That's the values. My response will focus primarily on one day in the history of the temple, April 3rd, 1836. On that day, Easter Sunday, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery bowed, probably as they knelt and engaged in solemn, silent prayer. As they arose from praying, they experienced a series of visions. They reported, the veil was taken from our minds and the eyes of our understanding were opened. And they saw Jesus Christ. He was standing on the breastwork of the pulpit, presumably just above them on the top row of pulpits. There are very few places on the earth where we can point to and say, the Savior was here. We are delighted that we can continue to share this special place, the Kirtland Temple, with the world. After this vision of the Savior closed, the heavens were again opened and Moses appeared before them, 
committing unto them the keys of the gathering of Israel from the four parts of the earth. Next came Elias, committing the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham. And finally, Elijah appeared, announcing that the time had come to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Joseph Smith called it our Pentecostal period, uh, but that's intellectual. The thing that I have found is that Kirtland is a place where you feel that's here. I've not found uh, to that extent anywhere else. These are holy places, I believe, wherever deity appears and you feel that. This is holy ground. There is little we do in this church of lasting significance that is not done under the authority of the keys restored on April 3rd, 1836 in the Kirtland Temple. That is why the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints spent over $192 million to acquire the Kirtland Temple and other significant properties, documents, and artifacts. Okay, Summer, how do you feel about the church's historian, Kyle McKay, explaining finally the rationale behind it, spending $200 million on these particular properties? When I heard about them acquiring it, my, my heart broke, first of all, for the Church of Christ, because it's been history for them for a very long time. It was a very, very difficult purchase for them to um, be part of. It was sad to see kind of a victory lap, first of all, when so many people are hurting over that type of purchase. But... I find it interesting that they couldn't find 192 million other reasons, other ways to spend that money. It's icky. I don't know how else to, to put that. I understand for Latter-day Saints, it's exciting and um, it's wonderful to have all the property, but especially the temple back in possession. But it is very sad to know that $192 million was spent on this building. The upkeep has been amazing um, because of what the Church of Christ has done. The history has been amazing. They have been a little bit more forthright, the Church of Christ has, whenever they do tours there. I'm curious to see what the tours are going to look like from the historians on the LDS side. I think it's very sad, and there's a lot more that money could have gone to. Yeah, we talked about this when the church did bought, bought those properties a few months ago. First of all, any transfer of wealth from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to the community of Christ is a good thing because the community of Christ actually engages in serious philanthropic efforts. They're externally audited, they spend all of their money, and they do it on alleviating homelessness, on poverty, and things like that. So I am in favor of any wealth transfer whatsoever from those two organizations. But as far as the actual Kirtland narrative is concerned, you know, the Mormonish podcast did an episode a little while ago called Elijah and the Ceiling Power in which Rob Lauer debunked the Kirtland narrative. We discussed that in a previous episode. I want to play this clip because, you know, people say the, the the church history events, they're a matter of faith. We don't know if they're happened. You know, it's part of our, it's part of our tradition. It's part of our faith. But the community of Christ, when they gave the tours in the Kirtland temple, they didn't talk about that, those miraculous events because the narrative and the providence is extremely suspect. And that's what we discussed on the Mormonish podcast here. And I wanted, I want to play this for you, get your reaction to, did these events actually happen? Because if this is the foundation, if this is the basis for spending all of that money and they didn't happen, then you could consider it a massive waste of money. So let me play this clip and get your reaction to us talking about President Nelson, Elder McKay, and the entire Kirtland Temple narrative. Now, the Sunday afternoon session is probably the most important session. And here we had President Nelson give his address. And guys, he spent a great deal of time talking about the Kirtland Temple. And I believe that's a particular topic that you guys know quite a bit about. We were yelling at the screen. This is an episode that we just put out with the amazing Rob Lauer. I think last week, you can find it on Mormonish Podcast, all about, well, you can see the title of our, of our episode, Elijah and the Stealing Power the Kirtland Temple narrative debunked. And maybe, Landon, do you want to go into this? Because everything that President Nelson said, this is not accurate as far as what happened at the 
Kirtland Temple. And one of our concerns with the Kirtland Temple now being in the hands of the LDS Church is the COC, Community of Christ, they did not share this narrative of Elijah, Elias, Moses, or the Savior because they've gone through the documents. They understand the provenance is not there to even show that this ever even happened. And now that it's in the LDS hands, I believe this is a story that is going to be told to every visitor that comes. We saw it shared by President Nelson today. Landon, do you want to go into this? Exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, that's right. To, to tell a narrative that they know isn't true, uh, right there in conference is, is just extremely uh, disappointing. Uh, we went through this uh, just on that podcast, as you said, and it's clear Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, neither one of them ever mentioned Elijah, Elijah, Moses, or Jesus Christ showing up in the temple. It's not there. It's not in the records. There's a third hand witness from uh, Oliver Cowdery's Warren brother, Cowdery. Warren, Warren. Warren, Warren, Warren Cowdery, that was written on the back page of a journal. Nobody knows where uh, where it came from. It has no date on it. Uh, okay. And so to, to make this claim with uh, Joseph and Oliver, not only did they never say they that it didn't happen, they kept referring to it happening in the future tense, that it would happen, that it will, that they shall come, that they will come, which is was a very Christian idea at the time, was that Elijah and Elias and Moses would come right before Jesus came in the end and restore all of these uh these keys. That was a Christian belief. And from the words that we see from Joseph Smith, he was still looking forward to that happening, even though this is eight years in the past that it supposedly did happen. So there's a huge problem with this narrative. The church leaders know this. They have to know this. And yet here they come out and tell you this story that just has no backing. Yep. And to be clear, so when we talk about a third party account from scribe um, Warren Cowdery, it said things like they beheld Jesus. They saw last page of a journal. The entry right before that entry is an account of Joseph Smith passing out the sacrament to all of the participants in the Kirtland dedication. And of course, we know the sacrament was wine at the time. So you have the entry about the wine. Then you have a third party account in the very end of a journal about seeing Elias, Elijah, Moses, the savior. So then what happens? This is 1836. We never hear about it ever again. Joseph and Oliver never mention it in their entire life that this happened in the Kirtland temple. Finally, in 18, I think 42, it's rewritten by Willard Richards into a first party account where it appears that Joseph says, I then saw the savior. I saw Elias. And this is given in a sermon by Orson Pratt. That's the origin of it. The provenance is very, very suspect. Now, I know they say it was originally a firsthand account. And as scribes often would, they will look at this firsthand account, supposedly written by Joseph or Oliver or both, and then they'll put it in the journal in a, as a third party. They'll change it to they. So again, they're hinging on this missing document out there where it was written. But to me, the smoking gun is just what Landon said. In all their orations, both Joseph and Oliver, they never said, Remember when that thing happened? Remember when Christ came and Elias came and Elijah came? They do not say that. They say, we look forward to the day Elijah will come. We look forward to, you know, the, the welding link, to the sealing power. And this was regular Christian rhetoric. So it was always a future tense. In their lifetime, it was never mentioned as something that had happened. So that's extremely problematic. And I would like more people to look into it. Uh, different people. Our friend Rob Lauer, he had a lot of information on it, but I would love to see this researched farther because it's a big deal if this is the narrative that everything hinges on, the sealing power, when as a post-Mormon, you have to stand outside the temple while your children are inside being married. What is really happening there based on their own doctrine and the provenance of these sealing keys? I think it needs to be looked at. Boy, I'm on a soapbox, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, this is a fantastic episode. And Rob Lauer did a fantastic job yeah. on what we learned from that episode, or at least a, what I learned from it, is the fact that not only was the priesthood restoration retrofit, the, the Aaronic priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, not only was the first vision retrofit, is that the Kirtland Temple narrative is completely retrofit. And what we saw in General Conference just a few hours ago was President Nelson trotting out a narrative in which we know that the facts are absolutely not accurate. It's not a matter of faith. We know that it did not happen because there was no contemporaneous effort 
uh, uh, no contemporary re record of it, and that the people who were involved said that these things were yet to come into the future. So it's a fantastical narrative that is completely divorced from reality, and President Nelson is doubling down on it, saying that these are the important things which are leading me to build temples. So the foundation for his temple announcements we know is built on a sandy foundation, and that's an incredibly problematic thing to take. Any, any other comments on the uh, Kirtland Temple narrative with regards to President Nelson on this, guys? I would just like to, I'd like to hear from somebody who has taken the tour, the new tour. I have yet to find somebody that's gone through because I would like to know what is being said. As Rob Lauer explained to us, the COC, Community of Christ, did not share this narrative because they did not trust or acknowledge the provenance of it as we explained. So I would like to I would like to hear. So if any of you have taken that tour, drop us a line. Let us know what they are saying. I love Rebecca and I love Landon. I just want to say with the reaction to that, um, that was what I was saying earlier is it's I'm curious to know what the history is going to be now because if it comes out that all of these things are not really true, ceiling powers, all of that, then what did we just buy, right? We bought a historic temple, but it's not where the ceiling powers happen. It's not where Elijah came. It's not all of those things. And so it, it does put a lot into question. I will say though, it is worth all that money to the church so that they can retrofit the narrative. They can retrofit history. And so at the end of the day, that is what happens. They take history and they make it fit into what they want it to fit into. And I think that that's exactly why it was worth $192 million was to make sure that the faithful saints and the believing saints hear history the way that they want them to hear it. You know, it's one thing to dupe the tourists who come through through the Kirtland uh, area. Most of them are Latter-day Saints, and they probably don't know the history of the fact that these events did not happen because they were spoken of in the future of Joseph Smith. Oliver Cadre never said once that these things happened, and they said that they were looking forward to them coming in the future, so we know it didn't happen. It's one thing for tour guides to do that, to dupe Latter-day Saint tourists and make sure they continue to pay tithing. What we have here is Elder McKay, the church historian, historian at the Mormon History Association Conference. All of these people know exactly what we know about the Kirtland Temple narrative, that it is complete fabrication and it is a total retrofit. And with a straight face, he's going to tell the most informed Mormon historians on the planet about how these things actually took place. I mean, the, the cojones of Elder McKay, who is not a historian, by the way, he's a lawyer, of him to trot that out is just absolutely bonkers. A lawyer? The church has another person in employment that's a lawyer? I, I, that's shocking. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me show you a couple of reactions of the tweets here with Elder McKay's address. And this is from at Black Blessed LDS. And he said, let me, let me get your reaction to the summer. He said, you could give all of that money to charity and people would still have something to be pissed about. That's not the real issue. Spend your money as you wish. The church has my consent once I pay the tithing. Is that true, Summer? People always just find something to nitpick about the church about? There are people that are going to find things to nitpick about the church. I just think the church needs a better job do, to do a better job of not finding things that are so easy to nitpick about. When Rebecca Bobiataka and Landon Brophy have more knowledge of the church history than the church historian does, that's a problem. And so, you know, sure, I've heard that a lot that, oh, no matter what, you're going to be upset no matter what. But at the end of the day, it's not on the members. It's not on non-members to be the ones that are upholding the standard of integrity and honesty, right? It is the church leaders. They are supposed to be the pillar. They're supposed to be the standard that the members and non-members are supposed to abide by their standards. And so I think it's easy to talk about, well, once the tithing is submitted, do whatever you want to do with it. That's great. But how about we be honest about where the tithing is going and what it is being used for? I know you're a big football buff, Summer, and that's why this particular article caught my attention. Steve Young is back in the news with regards to the Mormon History Association. And this was an article on the Church News just a couple of days ago on 15 June 2024. Steve Young's T-shirt miracles and a look back at the church's return to Kirtland. So let me show you what's happening in this. Historians at the Mormon History Association Conference tell stories, reflect on modern history in Ohio, and the fulfillment of a scriptural prophecy. So what happened here? 
This is this is unbelievable. In the early 1990s, San Francisco 49 quarterback and Latter-day Saint Steve Young was packing for a training camp and randomly grabbed a T-shirt from a pile in his closet that read Kirtland, Ohio, City of Faith and Beauty or the Kirtland T-shirt to football practice on a day when Sports Illustrated photographer snapped a candid shot of him walking with his teammate Joe Montana. The photo featured Young in the Kirtland t-shirt appeared in the magazine's Sports Illustrated issue, and it was touted as a miracle because it allowed the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to gain approval from Kirtland City to reroute roads and create the historic Kirtland Village. And according to church spokesperson here, there were 17 specific miracles that were associated with Steve Young wearing that t-shirt. Summer. You know, miracles, they're not all they're cracked up to be. You know, miracles aren't what I remember. I can tell you that right now. No, I mean, who needs seagulls where there's no sea? Who needs to be able to, you know, have a pond that freezes over so that all the pioneers can cross over and the next day it's July 31st and it's, you know, no longer a frozen pond. No one needs that anymore. We just need a T-shirt so that the city will approve something for the church. I think the real miracle here is that um, they did not have to bring in lawyers to sue the city. I, I think that that's a miracle in itself. It just needed a t-shirt. We didn't need, you know, millions of saints to come into a city and wear white shirts or blue shirts, depending on what the state president asked for, to make the city change their mind on the codes. Wait a minute. Steve Young is a very popular football player. Someone takes a picture of it. Now we have a miracle. I fail to see the divine <laughs> connection. But I noticed here, Summer, that the church still trots out people like Steve Young, big time football player, big time Latter day Saint. They still trot him out. But you know, I don't ever remember seeing the church talk about Burgess Owens and, and connecting any miracles or anything like that. I can't imagine why there's a difference between how the church treats these two uh, famous football player and Super Bowl champions. I don't know why they don't, because honestly, I can think of a miracle right off the top of my head, which is Brigham Young's address saying that there will never be a black or African descent man who will rule over him or his brethren in the state of Utah or the federal government. And here we are, 2020, my father's elected as a black African descent. He's literally ADOS, um, American descendant of slavery, who is ruling over Utah and in the federal government. That's a miracle. I mean, that is a huge miracle. But the church, for some reason, never discusses that miracle, that Brigham Young's prophecy just did not pan out. It's always interesting to see what the church chooses to emphasize and what they choose not to emphasize. Things that build people's quote-unquote faith are trotted out as miracles. Things that reflect negatively on church history, those are to be avoided. In fact, some things in church history are just destroyed and altogether. You know, I saw this tweet out here that said, if the church cared about preserving history, they wouldn't be destroying the Salt Lake Temple and other historical buildings with work with workmanship we can't reproduce today, but supposedly built by Mormon pioneers with hand tools. They're destroying and hiding history from you, not preserving it for you. So they're collecting up these church history sites. And when they do, they change the narratives and they whitewash what we had. And they also tear down various different monuments and reconstruct them in the manner that, um, again, promotes the faith promoting narrative, even though. Those were our pioneer ancestors. Those were the people who helped build those things. You know, the way the church deals with history is incredibly problematic, as um, as we saw from this week where the church historian is going out to give a narrative that he must know is false. He's He's got to know he's the church historian and the rest of the people, but it doesn't matter. It's just like, you know, you live in an alternate reality where you just have to keep believing what you're believing. And somebody told him that he needs to bring that narrative forward. Because why? Because President Nelson in the last general conference brought it up. Look, there is no Elijah and Elias. Those are the, those are two translations of the same person. It couldn't have been two people to begin with. Very, very problematic. And I want to just say Rebecca and Landon apparently are prophets because prophecies and revelators because they actually called it when the purchase happened. They said on Mormonish, this is to change the narrative of the history. And we are going to hear all about the sealing keys. I am going to start a petition to have them either be called to serve as tour guides for the Kirtland Temple 
or to possibly even be called as apostles so they can be up there with the seer and revelators. They'll get my vote for sure. And while you're at it, if you would like to see that, for those out in the comments, would you give us a like? Would you give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts? You can find this on Spotify. Give us a thumbs up. Turn on notifications. We'd be very grateful for that. Now, every single week, the church is building many, many temples, spending hundreds of millions of dollars on its global temple building spree. And I saw this uh, uh, tweet here by the Cultural Hall here who talks about the Philippines temple on this day back in June 15th, 2023, you get to see a picture of the temple or the front of the temple. You're going to see something very unusual and a little bit different. I love to see the temple. I'll go inside someday. I'll covenant with my father. I'll promise to obey for the temple. When it comes to building those temples, Summer, you spend a lot of money on the temples themselves, and that money doesn't trickle even five feet outside of the property walls. So this one hits a little close to home because I have Ohana in Maui, Hawaii, and the fact that there was a Maui temple announced recently, and that was after the wildfires, was heartbreaking to me because the people there are, they got together, they made it you know, they came together as a community for after the fires, the government was a little slow to respond and they were able to bring it back Maui, but there's so many historical things that were burned down and lost forever, including the old town in Lahaina. And so to hear the church then come out a little bit later and say that they're going to be building a temple in Maui, this Philippines TikTok reminded me of that because there's so many people that are suffering right there and you're bringing in billions, millions of dollars to build a structure when the people around it not only could use that money, but a lot of them cannot even attend the temple either because they're not endowed or because they're not a member. This is very heartbreaking and it actually is the reason why a lot of people across the country right now are very upset with the Mormon church, the Church Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because they are focusing more on buildings and less on community. Yeah, that's for sure. In fact, we saw this from the U UK Daily Mail. It's getting picked up across the pond here. Inside the bitter fight between the Mormons and small town America, the church is accused of bullying picturesque hamlets into letting them build towering temples. So the community say that building spree of mega temples will ruin their peaceful towns, but you know, some of the church opponents here have been labeled as bigots and threatened with legal action. Uh, Summer, are you a bigot if you don't want to have one of these very large structures directly next to your residential house? No, I think that I just don't have the, um, I just don't think God blessed me with a t-shirt and um, Steve Young's stature because <laughs> apparently that's all it takes. Um, <laughs> but it's sad because I feel as though that's what happens. We get to name calling instead of actually looking at the issue and why people have the problems that they have. Right now, it's not even about, oh, my peaceful space. It's about air pollution. It's about the fact that there are city codes in these areas that don't even allow street lights. I mean, they've kept their areas a certain way. And as a community, they've decided to do it that way. And then you have whatever church it is come in and say, you know what? We're better than you. We know better than you. God knows better than you. And to be fair and honest, if this was a temple for Scientology or a Buddhist temple that was coming in and saying, we want to build this in Salt Lake City and we want to have it be higher than the Salt Lake City temple, or we want to build it in Draper and have it be 150 feet higher than the Draper temple. LDS uh, saints would have a problem. Honestly, the leadership would have a problem and they would be trouting out those same lawyers saying that this is not up to code and this is not fair. And so I don't think it's fair to call anyone a bigot or um, say that they are against the church when we are not looking at what their true 
issues are, and those issues are just build whatever you want to build to code, just like everyone else has. And that's all they're asking for. And we're not being very Christ-like when we're not accepting that. Yeah, if you look at the actual article here, it shows this balloon here is floated 216 feet above this North Las Vegas uh, particular uh, community there in Lone Mountain. You can just see how tall that is when everything else is like 30 feet tall. It's eight times higher than anything else. It's truly tremendous. And the residents there in Lone Mountains are saying, you know, the, the, they're accusing the church of intimidation tactics in order to frighten protesters into science. And of course, it's not just in Lone Mountain that we're seeing these controversies. The more mega temples. We're seeing them in Bakersfield, California, in Cody, Wyoming, in Heber Valley, Utah, in Fairview, Texas, in Lone Mountain. The Mormon church has a list of more than 150 temples that are either planned or under construction with at least five already shown um, above that they're already being opposed by resident groups. And this is a big difference between the way the church operated in the late 1990s when President Hinckley did his uh, big temple push. When President Hinckley came in to church leadership in the mid 1990s, it was about 50 temples, and he doubled that to 100 by the time that he was done. How did he do that? With so called mini temples. These are very generally small structures, even smaller than some of the stake centers, smaller than some of the churches that were around. They were not especially very large structures, they didn't have huge spires, and they didn't probably cost that much money, maybe just a million or two dollars. Whereas the temples from the Widow's Might that we've read this week, the temples that the church is building, especially in North America and in the United States in particular, some of them are a approaching up to a hundred million dollars each. So that's why there's a lot of questions that are associated with this temple building spree. President Hinckley believes in the, it's not about the structure, it's about the covenants that we make inside, covenants and ordinances we make inside. And somebody recently said that the church leadership has been saying that uh, for the past couple of conferences, that it's not about the structure, that it is Elder Bednar, for those that don't know, had recently said that that it's not about the structures, that it is Elder Bednar, for those that don't know, had recently said that, that it's not about the structure. He said this just last year, it is about the covenants and ordinances that we make inside. And I think that President Hinckley understood that. He understood the spirit of what the temple is, not what the physical building is. What breaks my heart is for the residents and the church members that are residents of these towns, because what church leadership is doing is they're creating contention within the communities. They're coming in with their lawyers, you know, Curtin McConkie's coming in, they're saying what they're saying, they're intimidating the residents, and then they're leaving. They're going right back to Salt Lake or wherever they're coming from. And the residents that are there are the ones that have to live with the higher demands that are coming in. And to be fair, the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in these towns, if you were to ask them maybe six months ago, does Aspire matter? They would say, no, we just want a place to worship. So it's sad that it feels as though, you know, the higher leadership, the church leadership, the prophets, seers, and revelators are the ones that are pushing for the members to kind of be on the front lines of this. And then they're walking away and there is a lot of contention and hard feelings that are coming from this. Yeah, the big question is, does size actually matter? Because these temples are incredibly large as far as square footage is concerned. Those Hinckley temples, um, which were kind of prefabricated, they were generally in the range of, say, 8,000 to 13,000 square feet. The temples that we're seeing in these areas are up to 90,000 square feet, just absolutely extraordinary. And the question is, does size actually matter? Matter. And once again, Coach over at the Cultural Hall, you know, he posted this and he said, this is dedicated to the residents of Heber Valley, Utah. Let me play this, get your reaction. I'd like to see thy temple spire is reaching to the sky. <laughs> it's made the way God wants it, insanely tall and high. For the spire is the only thing that matters to the Savior. So we'll build it tall and we'll be proud. In this we'll never waver. <laughs> I love to see the temple. God lobbies where I'll stay. The members all walk past me, 
Cause I don't pay to play For the temple is a private club And you can't pass the foyer So if a temple comes to your town Make sure you have a lawyer. Fantastic. Keep on fighting out there, guys. You know, there's a lot. You guys have a lot of advocates. We know that it looks like an uphill battle, but you have a lot of advocates out there inside and outside of the church. Um, and I also would like to shout out Mormonish, Rebecca, and Landon. They have been on top of this. They have um, been following the actual meetings. They've been talking to the residents. So if anybody wants more information on that, you can also watch them. And, and they've been, Rebecca and Landon, been just on top of this. People can see nowadays what goes on inside of the LDS temples, thanks to people like Mike Norton and New Name Noah. When you see the harmful practices and very peculiar and really what most people would be considered cult-like behaviors that take place in a temple, it is no wonder that people are very reticent for these type of structures. And when it comes to church apologetics and so-called faithful channels, when they defend it, they never talk about really what actually takes place in the temple. They just want to say that it's religious bigotry, that it's persecution complex, and that people are acting in bad faith. I would humbly disagree with all of those characterizations. Let us know in the comments your thoughts about temples. Um, we'd be very grateful grateful for that. Now, this isn't the only temple thing that hit the news here this week here, Summer. Check this out. Church news. Across two weekends in March, young members of the church from Scotland and Ireland performed ordinances and found covenant belonging in the Preston, England temple. This was just a couple of days ago. Summer, let me get this straight. This is making the church news that a couple of young persons from a couple of young persons from Scotland actually went on a temple trip. That's what constitutes church news these days. In March, in March. <laughs> I mean, how low is the activity rate in Scotland if this is actual news of people going on a temple trip? I'm sitting here watching General Conference waiting for President Nelson's a face to change over to President Monson. I'm looking for miracles. I think I need to lower my standards a little bit. I don't think that miracles are the way they were when we were growing up or what we were told they were when we were growing up. Miracles are not what they used to be. In fact, from the article here, they said that it was a miracle that this took place. Again, back in March, several months ago, a few people did a couple of baptisms for the dead in a temple. That's a miracle. Steve Young wears a t-shirt. That's a miracle. That's all we've got going on. Gee whiz. The article itself says the miracles did not end there. Elder Mark G. Stewart commented that building on the success of the For the Strength of Youth conferences, our mission leadership effort was laser focused on enabling the rising generation to lead out and work peer to peer towards the temple and its associated covenants. We witnessed firsthand the young adults lead the youth to the mountain of the Lord where miracles occurred. Of significance was the introducing to the 11 to 13 year olds of the FSY format at the house of the Lord and watching the joy in their faces as they partook of God's work of salvation and exaltation. This is a miracle people just going for a routine temple trip. I did dozens of times when I was a kid. Oh That's a miracle. And, you know, miracles are just not what they cracked up to be. It's amazing. They're they're not what they used to be. They're not what they used to be. And you would think that there'd be more given that there's, you know, 85 temples announced at every general conference. So I don't I don't know what's happening. Yeah, it's amazing that this is considered a miracle when Nemo the Mormon points out that the church in this particular area where these kids came from is actually getting shut down. I They don't want to talk about that for some reason. What would you do if you just turned up to church one week and it was shut down? Sometimes when an LDS congregation shuts, they're given an opportunity to say goodbye, to bid farewell to their meeting house and to grieve the loss of a community. That was the case when the St Albans ward was shut. However, sometimes the ward is closed with no warning. People indeed turn up to church one week and the ward is shut. That's what happened this week with the Cumbernaut ward in Scotland. According to local members, a leader got up and announced that the members are now part of the Airdrie ward and the Cumbernaut ward is closed. Just like that, a religious community is gone. And need I remind you, the church is planning to build a temple in Edinburgh just down the road. Doesn't it seem strange that the church is closing congregations in the place that they are building a temple? Why do we need a temple in a place where there's very, very few active members and where it's declining and where we're literally just closing congregations left and right? It doesn't make any sense to me. 
Well, it makes sense if President Nelson is a fan of Kevin Costner and he believes if you build it, they will come. Maybe that's what's happening right now is let's build temples in areas that are having less members and maybe they'll bring more members. Or maybe we're building temples where there are less members and wards closing so that it appears like these wards are not closing and that there's growth. Either way, Kevin Costner fan or maybe play a little switch hand there. I don't know. Well, I released a video a couple of weeks ago from the only study that I'm aware of that discussed whether building new temples actually does bring new patrons. And the answer to that very preliminary study is that building temples has no effect whatsoever on the total number of ordinances and the total number of new patrons. When you build a new temple, people want to go to it for the first couple of months. There's a lot of temple tourists or people who are in the local area. After that, it trails off and it doesn't have much of an effect on most people. So that's at least what I've noticed from what I've studied. And as far as the if you build it, they will come mentality, the church in the 1950s, really under Elder Morrill and under David O. McKay, they engaged in the if you build it, they will come in particular in the United Kingdom. They built a bunch of chapels saying, if we build these things, then people will join the church. And what happened is that the church almost went bankrupt in the late 1950s. It has no effect whatsoever on people joining the church if you have a bunch of large structures or a bunch of meeting houses. I thought the church would have learned their lesson, but it doesn't seem like they have. You're the big time political lady here. And I saw this, this caught my attention here on the Deseret News. We see a poll here where Donald Trump, who is now a convicted felon leads big among Utah voters and Biden and RFK are both tied. After viewing both Trump and Biden unfavorably in August, most Utahns now see Trump favorably. This was a surprise for a couple of reasons. Number one, usually the Deseret News doesn't run anything that portrays Trump in a positive light. That was a bit of a surprise. It's a surprise that a lot of Latter-day Saints are still supporting Donald Trump and that the Deseret News seems to be getting in bed with someone who they'd had a very turbulent relationship with. All very true. And when I read it myself, I was very surprised because, like you said, the Deseret News, KSL, all those church-owned uh, publications are not favorable to Trump. What I believe is happening is that there is a little bit of a persecution complex happening where as we see within the LDS church, and I am a member, so I'm talking about myself as well, that if something is not going well, you tend to think that there is something bad or you're being persecuted. We just talked about that with these temples being built in these residents, that they are bigots, that they hate the church. But generally, it is actually just because something is happening. So in the case of Trump, he's just been indicted. There's been a lot of talk about whether this indictment is real, if it was, you know, if they made a, a mountain out of a manhole kind of thing. And what I think is happening is that a lot of LDS members are looking at this and believing that he is a victim. And LDS members love victims. And I do think that that might be why that he's getting a little bit more of a bump. It is a red state, so it's not something that Biden would carry anyway. But for Deseret News, I feel to be writing something favorable. I think they are starting to see that people are feeling bad for Trump. And they are saying that this is not fair and this is not right. And so I think that the tide is turning a little bit and they're starting to see that and they're trying to write to their constituents. Yeah, because Donald Trump really didn't do that well in the Beehive State in 2016. And part of the reason why is because of Evan McMullen took some of the votes away. We have a third party candidate here as well. Donald Trump did very very had a very tepid response in 2016. But if you look at the polling now that from this Deseret News Hinckley Institute poll, it says if the 2024 presidential election were held today and it was between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, who would you vote for? It seems like Donald Trump is doing much, much better in Utah. And again, that's presumably among a lot of Latter-day Saints, although I can't prove a causation. There's definitely a correlation there. You know, 42% of people in Utah affiliate themselves with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I would presume that those numbers are somewhat similar. But Donald Trump is doing very, very well in a head-to-head -head matchup against Joe Biden. And if you throw Robert Kennedy in there, who's kind of like the spoiler, kind of like playing the Evan McMullen from 2016, right. if 24 election were held today between all three of those, again, Donald Trump is running away with Utah, 49%. He's going to blow it out. He's 
unless something drastic changes, we're going to see Donald Trump carry Utah easily, in which in times past, it wasn't always so easy for him to carry the state. You know, I'm not a big political person. You have a lot more politics, you know, a lot more experience than I do. Mine is almost none. But when a candidate is convicted of a number of felonies, I would expect to see his support trail off or at least decline in some way. We're seeing the exact opposite here. And that's a bit of a surprise. It is a surprise. And I do think that we are in a different era. I think we are always going into different eras. And right now, we do have to also factor in the economy, how people are feeling about the border. There are a lot of other factors. And so I feel like there are people who at this point are starting to put things that they would have cared about in the past on the shelf and saying, you know what, I need to pay for groceries this week. I need to get somebody in that, you know, did well before that had a, a great job with the economy. When we talk about 2016, Trump was an unknown. He had not had a record before. It was more about what he talked about. You had Hillary Clinton, who was more known. And then you had Evan McMullen, who kind of was on the same stage, if you think about it, as Donald Trump, an unknown who's talking about what he could do. Now Trump can run on a proven record, given that he was previously president. And now we have somebody in office right now that is not really doing well with the polls. And so I think there's a lot of different factors. My shock was more or less Deseret News printing about it. I don't know if a lot of people remember, but in 2020, when the impeachment stuff was going on, Donald Trump did get a bump in Utah. He was not very favorable. But then when the impeachment trial started, again, the whole victim, you're not treating this person well. A lot of LDS people want to root for the underdog. So he did get a bump in the polls around that time. And I'm starting to see that right now with the indictment. But I do think also the economy and Biden being in office and just a lot of a litany of issues there is also playing into it. But I'm just surprised that Deseret News decided to report on it. That's very rare, considering the fact that Deseret News often runs in their editorial pages. They will run anti-Trump constantly in the <laughs> editorial pages, and they don't put it in as part of their so-called journal journalistic stuff. That way they right. can have a semblance of difference between the church's position and their editorial and the, commentators. Right. They're not going to run anything that's necessarily pro-Trump in the editorial pages at all. That much we um, right. can almost be for certain about. Now, the last poll uh, from this particular article here is, again, a surprise to me. Again, I'm not a big political person. I do follow it. I do like the news, but it's the favorability ratings because Joe Biden nationally, as far as favorability, is like in the low 40s. But among Latter-day Saints, his favorability is absolutely cratered. It says, do you have a favorable view of the following? Donald Trump, 52%. Joe Biden, 23%. RFK, 43%. Joe Biden's favorability in Utah is very, very low. And Donald Trump's is quite reasonable for a politician of his uh, background because it's hard for any of these politicians to get above 60% on favorability just because of the polarized nature of our modern day society of people being divided among Democrats and among uh, Republicans. It's pretty hard for anybody to get above 60. So Donald Trump is doing well. Joe Biden is not doing well at all in favorability with the fact that, as you mentioned, with inflation being high and some of the other things that we are seeing in, in, in today, from my perspective, it looks like Donald Trump is going to be running away with Utah unless we see something different. And the fact that it doesn't look like we're going to have any more trials in the Donald Trump dockets. You know, he's got the three other cases that yeah. we are waiting to hear from something like, I don't know, 90 other counts. I don't think any of those trials are going to take place. So I don't see anything shifting remarkably in the next couple of months before the election. It looks like he's going to be on his way to securing Utah's uh, electoral votes, Electric. which... Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Electoral College from Utah, which in the eternal scheme of things means absolutely nothing, but I still find it to be very interesting. <laughs> Any last thoughts here on Donald Trump, Mormons, and the Deseret News? It is a red state, right? So it's not a huge deal for Utah, for Donald to take Donald Trump to take Utah because it's kind of expected. I think that a lot of people are starting to, again, they're feeling it in their pockets. They want to change. But also in politics, exposure is exposure. And so even though it might be negative exposure, even though, you know, we're always talking about the indictments and whenever you turn on the TV, you're seeing that whether it's on Fox News or CNN, it doesn't matter. You're still seeing Trump's face and name recognition are a big deal. So I find it interesting that, um, Robert Kennedy is at 43%. That's really good for him because he doesn't have the corner on the market right now media-wise. But yeah, I'm not surprised about Trump taking it away because, I mean, it's a red state and 
people lean right here. Now, a couple of last articles to take us out of here. This is a big one here. Lloyd Newell from the Music and the Spoken Word, the so-called Mormon Tabernacle Choir, which has been renamed to the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square, has announced his retirement. And he said, we have been blessed to have Lloyd D. Newell as the host for Music and the Spoken Word for over 30 years. Brother and sister Newell's work with the choir is coming to an end as they embark on a new adventure. Let's hear from him. It has been such a blessing, such an honor and privilege, really a sacred trust that I feel that I've had all these years to be associated with such great people, to sing the most beautiful music ever created, and to have the opportunity to rub shoulders with people that I love, both here in the choir and orchestra and also in our huge audience around the world. I care about each of these people that watch and listen each week. And I know that it will continue and continue to be wonderful and beautiful. And the choir will live on. The music will live on. And I'm so grateful that I could be a part of this marvelous organization. I wish you every blessing, best wishes, and every blessing. May God be with you this day. And always. No one ever bags on the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. You go on to ex-Mormon Reddit, it's still a beloved fixture in the entire landscape of the United States. So I definitely wish him the very best on whatever else he's got going on. I am so grateful for the service that he's provided because that is the thing about the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. All members um, do give service and they give themselves. And I wish him luck on everything that he's doing. I hope that he spends time with his children and grandchildren, if he has any, and just kind of takes a break to enjoy life right now and not, you know, be thrown into another calling that takes him far, far away from his loved ones. So I, I wish him every, every blessing in the world. Yeah, the First Presidency has announced a new voice for the Tabernacle Choir's music and the spoken word. Derek Porter, 42 years old, old Bountiful, Utah, has been named the new executive producer, principal writer, and presenter of music and the spoken word. You know, one thing that I have noticed, uh, Summer, over the years of doing the Mormon News Roundup is there's certain positions within the church that are technically not priesthood callings, like BYU presidents, like church spokespersons, like music and the spoken word directors, like choir directors of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, and a bunch of other positions that are technically not ordained, they're not sustained, they're not priesthood offices, and yet we never seem to see women get called into these positions for some reason, and I do wonder why. Well, we're <laughs> just too sacred for those spots, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, that could, I, I never heard a rationale. That could be the answer. That's probably as good as we're going to get. I don't, I can't say, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that does take us to our final article here, which is wishing Elder Bednar his 72nd birthday. Here are a couple of quotes from the last year. And this really got me thinking here, Elder Bednar's birthday, he's going to be a generational prophet because in the next 10 years, he will most likely be at the helm of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, barring a health emergency or a catastrophe of some sort. And it really got me thinking here, you know, um, they, the church news brought up a bunch of quotes, but I also had a few quotes that I wanted to run you through for the Mormon News Roundup poll of the week. We release new episodes of the Mormon News Roundup every Sunday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you come on over to YouTube at that time, you can interact with us in the live chat. And what is the poll this week, Summer? What is the most inspirational teaching brought to us by Susan's husband? Right, Susan's husband. You ever heard why they call him Susan's husband, Summer? Are you familiar with that one? I'm not, no. Oh, yeah, this is an old, this is an old uh, joke here before we get into the poll. When Elder Bednar gave a particular address at BYU-Idaho, I think it was, or a state conference of some sort, it listed like two paragraphs of the fact that he's been a dean in Arkansas, that he's got a PhD, I believe, from Purdue, and that he's been a businessman, and that he has all of these incredible accolades. And then at the bottom, and it says, and David's wife will be there as well. So he got like three paragraphs of all of his accolades, and wow. it's David's wife, Susan, will be there as well. And she only gets one line. That's why the joke is now, anytime anyone refers to Elder Susan Bednar, husband. we just say Susan's husband Susan and give husband. her the couple of paragraphs. So that's just a, a tongue-in-cheek joke there. Happy birthday to Elder Bednar. I wish him the very best. He is legit my favorite apostle. I don't want to get into that now, but he is my favorite. I'd like you to be the first person to take our poll. Here's his first teaching. Number one. I am scripture. 
Right. This was back from a, uh, when he was at a state conference, the Mormon apostle declared that I am scripture, meaning people were asking him questions like, hey, what, what about the scriptures? What about this? What about that? And he says, you don't need to worry about that because I am scripture. That's number one. Or how about number two? There are no homosexual members of the church. You remember when he gave that pronouncement? I a thousand percent remember this one. Yes. Yes. I would do wonder if he wants to take that back because it seems like a complete uh, bunch of hogwash. I don't know. How about number three? Temple size doesn't matter. Meanwhile, you've got David A. Bednar running around saying this. I hear people, oh, that's a small temple. There's no such thing as a small temple. They're just temples. There's no such thing as small covenants or small ordinances. And see, that, that to me reflects this fixation on it's the building. Who cares what the size is if you have access to the same covenants and ordinances? Yeah, so size doesn't matter. We got it there right from the horse's mouth. That's why that's one of my favorite teachings there, Summer. I love that one. Or how about number four? The church doesn't need your tithing. Yes, this was back in May 26, 2022, when he was at the National Press Club briefing, which is in my neck of the woods in Washington, D.C. He said regarding tithing, quote, the church doesn't need the members money end quote. That's a very powerful testimony. You know what? I want to give bear my testimony that that is true. <laughs> I'd like to bear my testimony that is true as well. Great. The double testimony. That's very rare on the Mormon News Roundup. But uh, yes, that is one of my favorite teachings of Susan's husband. Or how about number five? You remember this one? When he oh crushed my that gosh, I remember this one. Yeah, when he I crushed remember that this. kid in the devotional. Look at that kid. He crushed him like a bug. Yeah, crushing a kid in the name of Lucifer. Oh, yes, gosh, this because, was heartbreaking. Yeah, he was uh, Im imitating what Satan does to you, and he was taking the role of Satan, which seems apropos, I might add. Or how about number six? You don't have free agency. Right. He said, have you heard someone say, a member of the church who has entered into the baptismal covenant, I have my agency, I can do whatever I want? Have you heard that? Yeah. Yeah. You know what the answer is? No, you can't. You don't understand agency. You don't have agency to do whatever you want. Do we not have agency, Summer? When I was growing up, the doctrine was that we had agency. But you know what? It may have changed from then. The doctrine <laughs> changes all the time. God changes his mind. Maybe he has let Elder Bednar know that we do not have agency anymore. Well, maybe David Bednar is actually talking about free will because there's a lot of people who say that we don't have free will. So I'm actually maybe in agreement with him because I'm not too sure about free will myself. Or finally, <laughs> we have number seven, which is when Elder Bednar, LDS Elder, a former college president, may have plagiarized his general conference talk. This was in the religion news service. This wasn't just in ex-Mormon Reddit. He had to issue a retraction and an apology. How do you feel about David Bednar plagiarizing his general conference talk? It didn't make big waves within the LDS community. I don't know why, but it did make big waves on TikTok and on other religious sources. And it's it was disappointing. But I think people started to realize maybe they don't write their talks the way that we were raised to think that they write their talks. I do wonder if he's using AI to write his talks these days, but I can't be certain about that. It's time to cast your votes. If you'd be the first person to take our poll, we'd be very grateful for that. Let's run over the uh, selections one more time for you. Number one, I am scripture. Or number two, there are no homosexual members of the church. Or number three, temple size doesn't matter. Or number four, the church doesn't need your tithing. Or number five, crushing a kid in the name of Lucifer. Or number six, you don't have free agency. Or number seven, that time where he plagiarized his general conference talk. How do you want to wish Elder Bednar a happy birthday? This is a tough one, but I'm going to say number three. Temple size, Temple doesn't, size matter. doesn't matter. And I'm going to say that one because I'm hoping that the residents of these places where the temples are being put will be able to use that um, on their side to uh, dispute why temple size does matter. You betcha. Now that does take us to our final segment, which is the Mormon News Roundup joke of the week. And I believe that you have that for us. What is a Mormon missionary's favorite type of car? Hmm, I'm not too sure. 
a convertible. Right. Okay. Yeah, I gotcha. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Nice. Nice. Now, what projects are you working on? How can people get in touch with you here, Summer? So I recently did um, a co-host episode with Jean Judson on Ladder Daily Digest with Randy Bell. It was amazing. We did it last week. I'm not quite sure when it's going to be on Ladder Daily Digest, but it was about proving that there's a God. It wasn't about religion. And so it was a very interesting episode. Uh, Dr. Bell is an amazing person to have on. The other thing that I'm working on right now is again with Gene Judson, we are going to have Matt Harris on Ladder Daily Digest coming up next week. Not sure when that will be on, but you can just subscribe and like Ladder Daily Digest and you'll be able to see that I'm very excited about talking to Matt Harris about his new book, Second Class Saints. It is so informative and there are things in there that the church has not put out in their journal discourses. And that is what I have coming up. Very excited about it. Yeah, I've listened to literally every single publicly available lecture from Matt Harris. I'm a huge fan. I had Randy Bell on the Mormon News Roundup once upon a time as well. So you've, you've selected a couple of absolutely tremendous uh, hosts and uh, interviews. I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. As far as the projects that I'm working on, every Monday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube, we will do an episode of the Mormon Movie Reviews. And tomorrow night, we're going to be reviewing the spirit of the game. This is a basketball show. I know you're a big sports fan here, but this is basketball, not football, where the Mormons go to the Olympics in the 1950s in Australia and field a team of Mormon elders who attempt to take Olympic gold based on a true story. Have you ever watched the spirit of the game here, Summer? I have never watched this. Well, if you join us tomorrow night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're gonna do a watch party and we'd be very grateful to have you. And I just want to make one last note, and that's if you feel like you can donate to this podcast on Patreon or YouTube, we'd be very grateful for that. Summer, I want to thank you so much for ruminating with me on the great and spacious Beehive. I want to give a shout out to Weird Alma on Bandcamp.com for this episode's music. Always think celestial and remember, remember. No unhallowed hand can stop this podcast from progressing. When it comes to nicknames of the church, such as LDS Church, the Mormon Church, to remove the Lord's name from the Lord's Church is a major victory for Satan. 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 This is the tagline no. of the show. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. you knew it. it. You got no it. Oh, sorry. No unhallowed hand. What, what, what? I want to make sure I say it correctly. No unhallowed hand can stop this podcast from progressing. That's what it is. No unhallowed hand can stop this podcast from progressing. Sorry, this show or podcast? I'll say that podcast, again. Podcast, podcast. Okay. <laughs>